Can you believe that the dead can talk? Because some deaths are real, while others are merely stories, this is the essence of the long-awaited season 5 of the classic American TV show Prison Break, which fans have been anticipating for a whole 8 years. Do you recall the ending of season 4? The finale had Michael sacrificing himself for the freedom of others, yet this sacrifice wasn't his life but rather his own freedom. What deep conspiracy lies behind this? Let's find the answers together in Season 5. The story kicks off with Prison Break Soul, T-Bag, T-Bag, swapping his prison uniform, which he had worn for the better part of his life, for a long missed suit, because he was released from prison by a mysterious benefactor, the guards, cursing, remarked, how does trash like you get help? You're just damn lucky. After saying this, the guards handed T-Bag his belongings from before his incarceration, including a letter sent to him by someone else. T-Bag strutted towards freedom, but when he opened the letter outside, his face revealed a look of sheer terror. Meanwhile, Lincoln is back to being hounded by debt collectors, feeling lost ever since his brother's death, barely escaping his pursuers. Lincoln arrives home to find T-Bag, who mockingly comments on his current plight waiting for him, just as Lincoln is about to kick T-Bag out. T-Bag hands him an envelope. Lincoln, shocked, finds a photo of his brother Michael, believed dead for years, thinking it's another of T-Bag's tricks. Lincoln couldn't dispute the authenticity of the postmark on the envelope, disbelieving his eyes, and T-Bag equally puzzled. Lincoln reads the letter, but neither can decipher its meaning, resulting in T-Bag being chased away. Lincoln then rushes to New York to find Sarah, noticing a red car that seems to be tailing him along the way. However, the red car soon turns away, and then a black pickup starts following him, only to also turn away shortly after. Feeling secure no one is following, Lincoln finally reaches Sarah's place. Sarah, having remarried and formed a new family with her husband Jacob and her son, doubts the authenticity of the photo, suspecting it to be edited, especially given her distrust of T-Bag's character. She has accepted Michael's death and urges Lincoln to do the same. In the evening, Lincoln visits Michael's grave, reminiscing about the past. Overwhelmed by his memories, he takes another look at the letter under the setting sun, revealing embossed letters beneath. Lincoln sensed something was off. He took out a pencil and erased the letters that could be rubbed off, ultimately revealing the word Ojijia from the remaining letters. A quick internet search reveals it to be a prison in Yemen, to prove the truth. Lincoln ventured alone to the graveyard in the dead of night, picking up a shovel to begin digging. Upon opening Michael's coffin, he was so shocked that he collapsed to the ground. A closer look revealed no body inside. Lincoln was so excited that he hugged Michael's clothes, which proved that Michael was probably still alive. As Lincoln prepares to inform Sarah, the red car that had followed him reappears. Lincoln cast a wary glance but noticed nothing out of the ordinary. Yet, as the green light flashed on, the person in the red car casually tapped a few keys on a computer, causing Lincoln's vehicle to uncontrollably accelerate and charge forward with fierce speed. With the brakes failing, Lincoln unbuckles his seatbelt and crashes into a barrier, throwing himself into the river. He picked up Michael's clothes and headed towards the shore. At that moment, the man followed him. Lincoln quickly hid behind a large tree. Just as the man was about to come over with a gun to check for a body, his plan was disrupted by onlookers who suddenly arrived prompting him to leave hastily. Lincoln hurriedly called Sarah to tell her. Before they could finish speaking, the black pickup that had been following Lincoln pulled up in front of Sarah's house, followed by a blonde woman armed with a gun approaching. Sarah, grabbing a gun, calls the police while running upstairs to find Mike, hiding in the bathroom with him and preparing to defend themselves with a dismantled towel rack. Downstairs, Jacob is shot in the leg, and the woman ascends the stairs. Just as she's about to open the bathroom door, police sirens grow louder, and the assailant leaves hastily. After confirming the assassin had left, Sarah quickly administered first aid to Jacob, then rushed him to the hospital. Lincoln arrived in time and expressed his desire to take Sarah with him to search for Michael. But Sarah, now with a new family and her husband in the emergency room, couldn't join him. Lincoln, understanding her situation, declared he would go to Yemen to look for Michael. Meanwhile, T-Bag, freshly out of prison, arrived at a hotel. He intended to look for some special services online when a hospital appointment email suddenly popped up on his screen. It was a meeting set with the director of the Prosthetic Research Center for 9.30 the next evening. T-Bag was curious. He had never made such an appointment, but then he thought about his prosthetic hand that indeed needed replacing, so he decided to meet the doctor as scheduled. The doctor was aware of T-Bag's condition and waited until after hours to receive T-Bag in order to avoid unnecessary trouble. 
he explained he had developed a cutting-edge prosthetic arm that could be controlled by the human brain, functioning no differently than a regular arm. This technology had received significant funding under the condition that Teabag would be the first recipient. Teabag suddenly remembered the phrase from the letter, through thy hands, the glory of the future is unveiled, realizing it must have been written for him. Thus, Teabag agreed to the prosthetic arm installation, instinctively. He asked the doctor not to use anesthesia, fearing what might happen while he was unconscious, but this wasn't the kind of sketchy clinic he was used to, concerned that the doctor might have ulterior motives while he was out. The doctor reassured him, I wouldn't dare cross someone like you, having allayed Teabag's concerns. The doctor gave Teabag a general anesthetic. When Teabag woke up and saw the prosthetic arm installed, he suspected the doctor might have implanted something else inside him and pressed for the name of the person behind this. The doctor didn't know who the mysterious person was, leaving only the word Udis to represent them. In Greek, Udis means nobody. On the other side, Lincoln, determined to go to Yemen to find his brother, sought out Benjamin, who had military experience in the Middle East and might provide some help. At this point, Benjamin had become a devout follower of Islam. Lincoln showed Michael's photo to Benjamin, hoping he could find some valuable clues. After analysis by Benjamin's colleagues, the building behind Michael in the photo was identified as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The map showed this building was not far from Ojijia prison mentioned in the letter, with no other buildings in between, indicating the photo wasn't forged. But when Benjamin called the prison to inquire, he was told there was no prisoner named Michael, guessing Michael might have changed his name. Lincoln tried to find a photo of Michael online to send to them, only to discover that all of Michael's photos had been replaced with those of someone else. Lincoln then realized someone was trying to erase all records of Michael, prompting him to urgently prepare for his trip to Yemen. Benjamin warned him that the area was in turmoil, and ordinary people wouldn't survive there for three days. But Lincoln was determined to save his brother, even if it meant going through hell and high water. Returning to the hotel, Lincoln donned Michael's old suit. Although it was a bit ill-fitting, he hoped it would bring him luck in finding Michael. Just then, someone quietly entered the room. Alert. Lincoln swung a punch, only to find out it was Sucre. Sucre had heard the news that his good friend Michael wasn't dead and hurried over to join the search for him. Lincoln did not want to put Sucre in danger, but Sucre followed Lincoln to the airport. As the two argued, Benjamin suddenly arrived. Mentioning he knew some of the mosque's followers in the area who could find someone to meet them, Sucre interrupted their conversation, insisting that if Benjamin could go, he definitely could too. Then, Benjamin delivered a metaphorical slap to Sucre with a string of Arabic phrases, leaving Sucre completely dumbfounded in an instant. It turns out, Benjamin had picked up some Arabic during his service in the Middle East. Lincoln told Sucre to wait for their good news and that they would call him if needed. Thus, Sucre left, albeit reluctantly. Thanks to Benjamin's connections, the two set off for Yemen, unaware that the assassin who had been after Lincoln was now tracking them. Yemen was embroiled in conflict, with everyone trying to flee the country, yet they were entering. Soon, an elderly man with white hair greeted them, believing he was the contact sent to meet them. The two didn't think twice before following him out of the airport. Then, a middle-aged man holding a sign with Lincoln and Benjamin's names appeared. The driver took them to an abandoned warehouse, and it was only then they realized they had walked into a trap as several thugs surrounded them. Benjamin handed Lincoln a hammer and took a wrench for himself. These thugs clearly underestimated their opponents, as they were quickly overpowered and left lying on the ground. Checking the thugs' phone, Lincoln found out they had been discovered while boarding the plane. At that moment, the real contact, Sheba, appeared. Her informant at the airport had noticed Lincoln and Benjamin getting into the wrong car and had followed them here. Lincoln and the others threw away all their phones to prevent further tracking by the assassin. Upon arriving at the place Sheba had arranged for them, Lincoln suddenly noticed the word Udis printed on his brother's clothes, identical to the message left by the person who had donated the prosthetic arm to Teabag. Sheba introduced them to Omar because he had connections inside Ojijia prison. Omar mentioned that there was an American in the prison who matched the description of Michael, but getting a visit was extremely difficult. Lincoln immediately thought it was just a matter of money, which he had. However, Omar wasn't interested in money, as in this turbulent country, money had lost its importance, but passports were highly sought after. Benjamin advised Lincoln not to give up his passport, as without it, he couldn't return to the United States. But eager for the chance to see Michael, 
Lincoln didn't hesitate to hand over his passport. They soon arrived at the prison, which was more brutal than Sona prison. Sheba asked the guard about a prisoner named Michael, but the guard firmly denied any such person. Fortunately, Benjamin thought to show the guard a photo of Michael, and the guard said the man was known as Udi's. Remembering the name on Michael's suit, Lincoln told the guard they wanted to see him. Considering Sheba had brought them, the guard agreed to let them visit Udi's. Sheba, hearing they were looking for this person, angrily turned and walked away. It turned out Udi's was a notorious terrorist imprisoned for murder. Michael was quickly brought up by the guards, seeing his brother after seven years. Lincoln was overwhelmed with emotion, unable to express his feelings. Michael now bore new tattoos. Lincoln urgently asked Benjamin to take out his camera to prove Michael was alive. But when Lincoln spoke of rescuing Michael, Michael claimed he wasn't Michael and didn't know them, then asked the guards to take him back to his cell. After finally finding his brother after so many years, only to be denied recognition, Lincoln was nearly driven to despair. In the prison cell, the narrow space was extremely oppressive, its conditions rivaling those of Sona prison. After the guard finished patrolling the room, Michael asked his bunkmate, Whip, for a wrench and then removed the ventilation panel from the ceiling, preparing to climb onto the roof. His roommate, Sid, kept watch while Michael and Whip quickly made it to the rooftop. This was their seventh consecutive day there, waiting for the signal to escape. A double flash of the city's lights meant that the escape would begin in 24 hours. But after waiting half the day, there was still no sign. Watching the war spread outside, Whip grew anxious, fearing they'd soon become cannon fodder, and cursed loudly. Michael reassured Whip, telling him not to worry because he had a plan B, which he hadn't wanted to use. But now it had begun. The next day, Lincoln and Benjamin were still puzzled over why Michael refused to recognize them. Just then, they heard footsteps at the door. Lincoln opened the door to find a child who, upon seeing Lincoln, ran away, with Lincoln chasing after him but quickly losing track in the unfamiliar surroundings. After Lincoln returned, Benjamin handed him the origami crane left by the child at the door. A signature message from Michael. Lincoln unfolded it to see the handwriting was indeed Michael's. The note inside read, Find the Sheik of Light, and I will regain my freedom. Lincoln finally felt relieved, realizing Michael's refusal to recognize him was likely due to fear of being discovered by others. Now, their task was to find the Sheik of Light, but they had no clue who that might be. Benjamin decided to seek Sheba's help, who was at that moment trying to persuade her father to leave the city. However, Sheba's father knew they didn't have the funds to escape the country, leaving Sheba feeling helpless. When Benjamin arrived with Lincoln, Sheba reacted as if she'd seen an enemy. In her eyes, the person Lincoln wanted to save was a terrorist who had persecuted their country, and she swore she'd never help again. But Lincoln pulled out a stack of money, willing to make a deal with Lincoln to get the money needed to escape the war zone with her father. Sheba took the note from Lincoln, although she had never heard of the Sheik of Light and guessed it was a code. Noticing a piece of tape on the note, Sheba peeled it off to reveal a series of holes, which she guessed might be a phone number. She tried calling and reached the voicemail of Muhammad, the region's electrical engineer. Lincoln was sure this man was the Sheik of Light Michael had referred to. They drove to the electrical engineering department, where they learned Muhammad had gone to the suburbs a week ago to look for his trapped daughter. After getting the address, Sheba marked it on the map for Lincoln, advising them to go alone since the suburbs were on the front line of the war, posing a life-threatening risk. However, since Lincoln had yet to pay, he still had the upper hand. To get the money, Sheba had to help find the Sheik of Light, so she reluctantly led them toward the battlefield. Soon, they arrived at a government checkpoint, where soldiers warned them that going further was akin to a death sentence. Lincoln then pulled out money, betting with the soldiers that if he didn't come back, the money was theirs. The soldier then ordered his subordinates to open the gate and let them pass. Seeing the once bustling streets now in ruins, with walls plastered with portraits of the terrorist Abu. However, this Abu had already been imprisoned in Ojijia prison, the same prison where Michael was being held. Should Abu escape, the situation would undoubtedly be worse than it already was. Just then, their vehicle was spotted by the enemy. Sheba told Lincoln and the others to quickly duck inside the car. Soon a man approached to talk. And coincidentally, they knew each other. From their conversation, it was evident they had an unpleasant past, but now they were irreconcilable enemies. As the talk seemed about to escalate into trouble, they suddenly received news of an attack by government forces and hurried off to confront it. This allowed them to escape the situation without harm. However, when they arrived at Muhammad's location, they were suddenly confronted by a group of rebels at the entrance, with no other choice. 
They had to climb over a wall from another spot to enter. As soon as they entered the house, they were ambushed by Muhammad, who had been hiding, thinking the rebels had broken in. After confirming their identities, they wanted to take Muhammad with them, but he refused to leave unless his daughter was rescued. Muhammad disclosed his daughter's location to Lincoln, but the rebels outside seemed to have heard noise inside the house and were desperately searching around. It seemed not only could they not rescue the people, but they would also be trapped. At that moment, Muhammad mentioned there was a back door they could escape through, but they were a step too late as enemy vehicles had already parked at the back door. When they felt out of options, Lincoln instructed them to hide on the roof while he sneaked to the pickup truck. When the enemy is not looking Lincoln throws him out of the car in a couple of moves. Then he goes to the window to inform Muhammad's daughter to prepare to escape. Lincoln started the enemy's pickup and took Muhammad's daughter and the students away, quickly meeting up with Sheba's vehicle. Just as they were celebrating their imminent success, an enemy vehicle equipped with a heavy machine gun approached, and they desperately headed towards the city. The government forces noticed them, knowing that charging directly at the government checkpoint would be mistaken for a terrorist's suicide attack. Sheba stopped in advance and waved a white cloth. The government forces identified the enemy vehicle and opened fire directly at the machine gunner. Seeing Muhammad's daughter and the students successfully rescued, Sheba's impression of Lincoln changed dramatically. After they settled down, it was only after Lincoln's interrogation that they found out he was the Sheik of Light, also the father of Michael's roommate, Sid. Sid had been sentenced to 20 years in prison for falling in love with another man. As homosexual relationships are forbidden in this country, a few weeks ago, Muhammad visited his son in prison, where Sid told him that if he could manage to cut the city's power, someone could help him escape from prison. The plan had been arranged to take place a week ago, but it was delayed due to his daughter being surrounded by terrorists, which is why Michael had been climbing to the rooftop for seven consecutive days waiting for a signal. Lincoln said they were still in prison waiting for your message. Hearing this, Muhammad hurriedly got up ready to act, because their agreement was to give them a double flash 24 hours before the blackout, but whether this city could last another 24 hours was still in question. Meanwhile, far away in New York, Sarah was sending Mike to school when she suddenly received a video from Lincoln, seeing Michael, whom she thought had died years ago, still alive. Sarah was moved to tears. At that moment, her husband Jacob, who was still in the hospital, called. Sarah answered the phone trying to sound calm. Jacob felt like Sarah knew something she shouldn't, but she diverted the conversation. Later, Sarah went to the government department seeking help, only to be received by Deputy Director Paul. Having had some previous issues with him, Sarah worried she might fall into a trap again and thus turned to leave. However, hearing Paul mention information about Michael, she couldn't help but follow her curiosity into his office. Paul pulled up the terrorist Udiz's file, which shockingly had Michael's photo, and it matched previous records exactly. Only a few people, including a genius like Michael, could pull off something like this. Paul suspected it might be Michael's own plan, but Sarah didn't believe these claims and turned to leave the office. Just as Sarah got home, Paul sent her an email. The surveillance footage in the email showed Michael personally killing the deputy director of the CIA and then moving the body. The next day, Michael boarded a plane to Yemen. As soon as Michael got off the plane, the CIA began their pursuit. Although Michael managed to escape, he didn't have time to take his luggage, which contained clothes with the victim's blood. Hearing this incontrovertible evidence, Sarah didn't know what to do. She confided in her current husband, Jacob. Jacob explained to Sarah using his knowledge of game theory, he said Michael would sacrifice anyone to achieve his goals and always had his own schemes. He also mentioned that Michael approached Sarah only to escape from prison and would leave as soon as his objectives were met. This, according to Jacob, was the real face of Michael. Despite these absurd explanations, Sarah couldn't believe Michael would become like this. Meanwhile, Michael was in prison, making meticulous plans to communicate with the outside world. He set his sights on his roommate Ja's phone, Ja a top-notch hacker from South Korea and a bona fide addict. No one knew how he managed to bring a phone into prison, he could hack into financial systems of various countries from home, which led to his imprisonment. To get Jaws' phone, Michael's next actions were astonishing. He asked Sid for a piece of gum and then took off the foil wrapper, tearing it into a strip about 8 millimeters wide. He attached the foil's ends to the positive and negative terminals of a battery. The thin foil was quickly ignited due to the short circuit. Then, he used the generated fire to boil water, and then soaked a towel in the boiling water, wrapping the hot towel around his head. Whip quickly called the guards, saying Udi's had a high fever that needed immediate treatment. This way, Michael successfully made it to the infirmary. However, 
Since he was considered a terrorist, the guards loathed him deeply and took out their frustrations on Michael. Soon, Michael was beaten to a bloody pulp, after which the guards gave him two pills. Michael pretended to swallow the pills, then was sent back to his cell. Michael spat out the unswallowed pills and told Ja, who was addicted to drugs, that they were derivatives of morphine. Hearing morphine, Ja perked up, but Michael said he could only have them if he could borrow his phone to order a pizza. The scene shifts to Sarah in New York, picking up her son from school. However, after all the kids had left, she couldn't find Mike. Sarah frantically searched and fortunately found Mike in a nearby park. Mike handed his mother a paper rose, saying a pizza delivery guy gave it to him. The paper rose, once a symbol of Michael's undying love for Sarah, had a message written on it. The storm is coming. All beings must hide. Sarah intuitively felt Michael was in trouble. Meanwhile, Michael was in prison, waiting for the chance to escape. At that moment, Sid came over and said the leader of the terrorist group, Abu, was closing in on them. Since it was the month of Ramadan, Abu, who was in solitary, would be released back to the general cell block, where heretics, sinners, and foreigners would be killed by them. Just then, the lights flickered twice. Sid realized someone had found his father, meaning the escape was set to begin in 24 hours. However, what they didn't expect was that the terrorist Abu and his followers had already been released. Sid and others were scared and hid, but Michael stood still. Abu looked at his own blood-stained hands and put them on his face to smell them. Then he walked straight towards Michael. Unexpectedly, they embraced each other like brothers. Abu asked if he had planned the escape. Michael, with full confidence, said, it officially starts tomorrow night. The man glanced outside the cell and saw no guards, then started his escape plan. He copied the tattoo on his arm onto a piece of paper, folded it into a plane, and added a piece of chewing gum. While a young boy was picking things up outside the prison, Michael skillfully flew the paper plane out of the prison. The boy set aside what he was holding, picked up the plane, and stuffed the gum in his mouth. Quickly, the boy ran to Lincoln's residence. As usual, stealthily slipping the paper plane under a mat. But this time he was caught red-handed by Lincoln. Through Sheba's translation, they learned that the young boy was sent by the bubblegum man, receiving a piece of gum as payment for each errand, though he had never seen the bubblegum man himself. Seeing the boy's terrified appearance, Lincoln took out all the candy from his pocket and gave it to him, telling him to continue delivering messages. Seeing Lincoln's kind side, Sheba found the man before her not so detestable after all. Noticing the strange ancient blue script on the letter, which seemed to form a pattern, Benjamin, who was looking at a city map, was inspired. It turned out Michael had drawn a map of the city with a red dot marked on it, clearly the place Michael wanted them to find. They found an abandoned cabin according to the marked location and determined that Michael had planned the escape there from the various documents filling the walls. The retreat point indicated it was currently under terrorist control. Seeing a portrait of the terrorist leader Abu on the table, they realized that Michael wasn't the only one escaping. Meanwhile, Abu, just released from solitary confinement, prepared to enforce his laws in the prison, executing all infidels and homosexuals directly by hanging. The guards upstairs turned a blind eye to this. Soon, Michael's cellmate Sid was caught for being homosexual. Whip and Jaw wanted to rescue him but were stopped. Michael hurriedly told Abu that Sid's help was needed for the escape, but the cruel Abu was unmoved. Seeing poor Sid about to be hanged, Michael defied Abu's obstruction and went to save him. As the situation was about to spiral out of control, the guards upstairs fired a warning shot, then gathered the prisoners together for re-education. Meanwhile, Michael successfully sent a message to Sarah through his son, which was spotted by the assassin who had once tried to kill Lincoln and Sarah. They followed Sarah to the hospital where Jacob was staying and secretly hacked Sarah's phone while they were being intimate. Sarah went to the bathroom, and at that moment, the psychopathic killer Teabag appeared behind her, leaving Sarah utterly panicked. But Teabag seemed to bear no ill will, telling Sarah that someone named Udis had donated a mechanical arm to him, a high-tech device worth at least a few million. Confused, Teabag went online and discovered that Udis was Sarah's ex-husband, Michael. I looked up Outis on the interwebs. Whose face comes up at your dead ex-husband's looking very much alive? Lazarus arisen from the dead. He's drawn us into something, isn't he? Come near me or my family again, I will kill you. Teabag secretly approached Sarah to understand the reason behind this. But Sarah, knowing Teabag's despicable nature, refused to cooperate with him and walked away without using the bathroom. At that moment, Sarah took out her phone and noticed the information constantly changing, realizing her phone had been hacked. 
She hurried to a phone repair shop and asked the owner to check who had controlled her phone. Ten minutes later, the two assassins arrived at the shop based on the phone's location and demanded the shop owner reveal Sarah's whereabouts. Seeing their violence, the shop owner had no choice but to confess. While Sarah watched everything from across the street, the assassins noticed Sarah too and rushed over. Sarah ran away, opening the back door only to find no exit. In desperation, she crawled through the next room to the rooftop. The assassins followed her up. Sarah ran desperately on the rooftop but found no other way out. Seeing a garbage truck below, she prepared to jump. When the assassins reached the rooftop and found Sarah gone, they looked down at the departing garbage truck, thinking Sarah had hidden inside to escape. A.W. cursed out loud, complaining about why Poseidon hadn't let her kill Sarah sooner, then stormed off angrily. Unknown to them, their conversation was clearly heard by Sarah hiding under the pipes. Back home, she received a call from the phone shop owner. The phone shop owner found out the reason her phone was hacked. It was because someone had used Sarah's fingerprint to gain control over her phone. Sarah suddenly remembers that when she went to Paul's office, she received a glass of water and her fingerprints must have been left on it. She shared this with Jacob, who had just been discharged from the hospital. Jacob urged Sarah to report to the police immediately, but Sarah, knowing the police couldn't solve this issue, decided to sell her phone to the shop owner instead. Jacob questioned if she was just running from reality. After some calm reflection, Sarah said that her biggest lesson over the years was choosing to run away. Thus, she decided to take action like Michael. Sarah immediately called Teabag to collaborate and asked him to investigate Paul, suspecting him of stealing her fingerprints. Meanwhile, in Yemen, Michael and Whip were queuing for food. After terrorist Abu embraced Michael like a brother upon being released from solitary confinement, Whip began to doubt Michael's allegiance, because the mission given by Poseidon was to rescue Abu, indicating Abu was affiliated with Poseidon, yet they were abandoned by Poseidon, and Michael still promised to help Abu escape. Confusing Whip, Michael explained that he only temporarily agreed to help Abu escape to ensure their safety until the right moment to ditch him. Despite Michael's explanations, Whip remained unsettled. Then, Michael devised a plan upon noticing a guard's watch and suddenly punched Whip in the face. The two of them were struggling, and the guards came to pull them apart. The ensuing scuffle allowed Michael to stealthily steal the guard's gold watch, explaining it was all a misunderstanding, leaving Whip utterly confused. After the guards left, Abu approached Michael, comforting him with promises of their imminent escape. Michael whispered something to Abu and walked away. Back in the cell, his cellmates were puzzled by Michael's actions and his close relationship with terrorist Abu, casting doubt on his stance. To clarify, Michael disclosed the entire plan. A guard, suspecting Michael had stolen his gold watch during the commotion, turned their cell upside down in search but didn't find the watch. Frustrated, the guard locked all prisoners in their cells to search for the watch. Aligning with Michael's plan, locked in solitary, Abu could only stay in his cell, while the escape could only proceed from Michael's cell. Once Sid's father, Muhammad, successfully cut the power, they could disappear from the cell like ghosts. Meanwhile, Abu boasted to his followers about Michael's promise to lead he out of prison. The original plan was to escape alone, but Abu insisted on taking his followers. At that moment, the guards who were looking for the gold watch arrived and started a carpet search of Abu's cell and found the gold watch in Abu's clothes. Abu realized he had been played. Simultaneously, to ensure Michael's successful escape from war-torn Yemen, Lincoln and Sheba worked on getting passports for leaving the country. Benjamin and Muhammad were responsible for cutting the city's power supply. They quickly arrived at the meeting place. But when Lincoln checked the passports, they turned out to be blank. Sheba was then taken away by Cyclops, who had been lying in ambush. And Lincoln, outnumbered, was knocked unconscious. Cyclops demanded to know the identity of the man who came with Sheba. When Sheba refused to cooperate, Cyclops punched her. It turned out they were former classmates and had dated. However, Cyclops lost control and attempted to do unspeakable things to Sheba, resulting in her blinding him in one eye. And they became enemies, seeing Sheba now trapped like a bird in a cage. Cyclops took the opportunity to try and finish the vile act he hadn't completed years ago. Meanwhile, Lincoln awoke from his unconscious state and heard Sheba's desperate screams. He wedged a metal rod into the bottom of the door and, using his strong physique, quickly broke it open, just as Cyclops was about to succeed. Lincoln threw him out of the room and began to beat him mercilessly. Meanwhile, Muhammad and Benjamin had arrived at the main power station. Muhammad expertly pulled down the circuit breaker and then instructed Benjamin to turn off the backup power while he dealt with the security guards. Faced with the complex wiring, Benjamin, overwhelmed, 
decided to forcefully sabotage it while wearing insulating gloves. Sure enough, the city's lights went out, and the prison cells plunged into darkness. Michael and his team, having waited for this moment, immediately started their escape plan. Abu, just taken away by the guards, seized the chaos to fight back. Knowing Michael intended to leave them behind, Abu and his followers hurried to Michael's cell. Hearing Michael was escaping, Cross from the neighboring cell decided to flee with his brothers. They ambushed the guards, stole their keys, and opened Michael's cell door to prevent the two from following. Whip dismantled the bed with his feet. However, with the rooftop guards nearby, they had no chance to escape through the hole and were trapped in the ventilation ducts. Cross and his brother, standing on the bed frame, stretched into the hole in the rooftop and then grabbed Sid, pulling him down from above. As the standoff continued, Abu and his followers arrived. Seeing the escapees, Abu's men shot and killed Cross's brother, with no choice. Michael abandoned Sid and fled. As Abu and his men were about to follow, armed guards arrived. Outnumbered, Abu reluctantly put down his gun. When the guards entered the cell and noticed the hole in the roof, they immediately called for rooftop patrol. Michael and his team, having just climbed out, were caught. Benjamin, coming to assist, saw Michael and his team captured and had to leave disappointedly. Injured Lincoln also hurried back with a barely alive Sheba. The years-long escape plan ended in failure, and Michael and his team were placed in solitary confinement. Terrorist Abu, now aware of Michael's stance, threatened that Michael's death would come once he was released from solitary. Michael, usually a master strategist, was now in despair. He took out Jaw's phone to record his last words. However, before he could send the video, the phone automatically shut down. If I, if I do die, make them put my real name. I don't have to put Katie Loudis on my head still. This was Michael's most desperate moment in seven years. So desperate he began recording his own last will and testament. Just moments ago, Michael's carefully concocted escape plan was on the brink of success when it was thwarted by the guards catching them in the act. Resulting in their confinement, the terrorist, Abu, housed in the cell opposite Michael, upon discovering he was duped, vowed that Michael would be the first he'd kill once he got out. Worse still, the sound of artillery was ominously close, suggesting that even if Abu didn't kill them, they'd likely become cannon fodder in the war. Yet, even faced with death, Michael sought a glimmer of hope for escape. He instructed Whip to search their cell for a mark with an S. During his four years of solitary confinement in this very place, Michael had crafted tools for escape. If they could find it, they might just manage to break out of their cell. However, despite their efforts, they failed to locate what Michael had described. At that moment, Abu found the mark Michael mentioned in his cell and gloated, telling them to just wait for death there. Meanwhile, the injured Sheba was taken to the hospital by Lincoln, Sheba's father, Zakat, in gratitude to Lincoln, claimed he might have a way to save his brother. Zakat approached a federal judge he knew through his political connections, offering his BMW in exchange for a pardon for Michael in prison. They arrived at the prison quickly, due to the guards seeing terrorists infiltrating the city and panicking, everyone prepared to flee. It turned out the federal judge had anticipated the prison's abandonment, making the pardon he provided essentially worthless. Upon witnessing the situation, Lincoln quickly asked Zakat to take Benjamin and the others to the airport, making sure to reserve two seats for himself and Michael, before he dashed into the prison to rescue Michael. At this time, the captain of the guards, focused solely on escaping, locked other prisoners and guards inside the prison before clumsily running into Lincoln, who was heading towards the prison. By the time Lincoln arrived, he learned the keys had been taken by the person he had just encountered, so he hurried back to chase down the captain of the guards. Just as he reached the door, Lincoln nearly met his end by a shell. He got up and followed the guard's escape route, tracking him down to an alley. The guard, stumbling upon terrorists, was shot dead before he could draw his gun. However, Lincoln, being a foreigner, couldn't retrieve the keys from the guard's body. The prison was in chaos. The prisoners attempted to break down the main gate, but Cross, Understanding that terrorists had taken control outside, knew they stood no chance of survival if they managed to get out. He proposed that their only leverage was to take the terrorist leader, Abu, held in solitary, hostage to negotiate with the enemies outside. Inspired by Cross's passionate speech, the prisoners were ignited. Michael and others in solitary confinement heard the commotion outside. Hearing the prisoners attempting to break the solitary confinement doors, Michael saw a bargaining chip. He asked Abu if he wanted to reconsider their cooperation to escape the solitary confinement. Abu was still resistant at first, but as the sound of the inmates banging on the door got louder and louder, 
Abu panicked and agreed to work with Michael, following Michael's instructions, he found a loose brick, pulling it away. They discovered a rope and a spoon inside. The rope had been made from threads of clothing accumulated over the four years Michael was in solitary, and the spoon was acquired unnoticed during a lockdown. Michael instructed Abu to tie the rope to the spoon and then hang it from a pipe above their cell. With a slight tug, Abu pulled down the pipe. By fixing the spoon to one end of the pipe, they fashioned a rudimentary tool for escape. Outside, Cross grabbed Sid, threatening Michael and the others to surrender. The frail Sid had no strength to resist. Fortunately, a dedicated prison guard with a gun managed to control the situation. He wouldn't allow any loss of life in the prison and ordered everyone to hide back in their cells. Thus, Sid narrowly escaped disaster. However, Cross, with a strong will to survive, began to brainwash the guard. He claimed that if terrorists invaded, they would be allies. Now, there was no distinction between guards and prisoners. If they worked together to capture Abu, they could all escape together. You just need to hand over the keys to the solitary confinement. Although the guard was somewhat shaken, the keys had already been taken by the captain, rendering him valueless. Cross took advantage of the guard's distraction, killed him, and then seized the guard's machine gun to shoot at the door of the solitary confinement. At this moment, Abu, following Michael's instructions, began to pry the door hinge. The cunning Abu didn't intend to release Michael but instead started prying his own door with tools. Michael urgently explained that this was futile, as the hinge on his side couldn't be removed without a key, which was in the warden's room. Michael assured Abu that if he did as told, he would release him, hearing the door to solitary confinement about to be breached. Abu had no choice but to trust Michael again. Abu slowly hooked up Michael's side of the door hinge with a spoon. After some effort, the upper hinge was unhinged, and then the same was done for the lower hinge. Michael, using all his might, dismantled the cell door, then grabbed the keys to release Whip and Jaw. Whip advised Michael against releasing Abu, since terrorists had occupied the exterior. Escaping the country would be difficult. Even if they managed to flee the prison, they still needed Abu as a talisman to ensure their exit from the country. So Michael released Abu. With time running out, they hurriedly fled. As the door to solitary confinement was opened, Cross, seeing that they had escaped, quickly pursued them. Michael and the others arrived at the infirmary, then forced Abu to arrange a vehicle to the border. However, they couldn't understand Abu's language. Michael also had a trick up his sleeve. He tore a corner of the map, marking it. Just then, Cross arrived at the infirmary with his men, forcing them to hide quickly. Cross searched cautiously but still failed to find them. They saw prisoners scaling the wall and decided to follow suit. But Cross spotted them and forced them back into their cells. Cross quickly caught up and killed an innocent prisoner. The fallen dagger was discovered by Sid, hiding under a bed. Michael and the others were also hiding under beds, watching as Cross slowly approached ready to risk a surprise attack on him, or they would all die by Cross's gun, just as Michael was about to rush out. Sid, picking up the dagger from the ground, stabbed Cross first. Seeing Sid's action, everyone joined in to help, and with a scream, Cross died on the spot. Meanwhile, Lincoln, struggling to obtain keys from a deceased guard, was approached by a young boy delivering messages. Though young, the boy knew the evils of terrorists and wished to fight the enemy with Lincoln. Following Lincoln's plan, he had the boy mislead the terrorists about an American's location, successfully drawing them away and easily obtaining the keys from the guard. He arrived at the location agreed upon with Lincoln, who then exchanged candy with the young boy for the keys before hastily heading towards the prison. Lincoln released all the prisoners and rushed to find Michael, suddenly seeing Michael and the others scaling the wall. Lincoln desperately called out Michael's name, but to no avail, with no other choice. Lincoln had to run out of the prison to continue searching for Michael. Meanwhile, far away in New York, Teabag, following Sarah's instructions, had already set his sights on Paul. Teabag followed Paul to his home. But Paul, being an ex-agent, was highly alert. Hearing noises, he quickly grabbed his gun to investigate. But the cunning Teabag hid too well, eluding Paul's detection. Paul, unaware of anything amiss, put down his gun and went back to making juice. At that moment, Teabag picked up a gun, aimed at Paul, and first landed a punch as retribution for not having pardoned him years ago. Then, Teabag interrogated Paul about why he hacked Sarah's phone and sent assassins to kill her. This left Paul utterly baffled. It wasn't until Teabag mentioned the name Poseidon that Paul began to understand Teabag's actions. He explained that Poseidon never contacted anyone through the internet, and even nuclear submarines couldn't find him. Getting involved with Poseidon essentially meant death for Michael. 
Poseidon was a rogue CIA agent, sought after by the agency, but no one knew his whereabouts. He was a hawk, opposing government foreign policies, wishing to destabilize other countries without deploying a single soldier. This was why Poseidon wanted Michael to rescue the terrorist Abu, aiming to use him against Iran and Russia, ultimately disrupting the global order. As soon as Paul finished speaking, he was shot and fell to the ground. Seeing this, Teabag hurriedly fled for his life. Teabag escaped to the basement, then blocked the door and made his first ever emergency call. There's a time for everything. 911? I need help. The dying Paul, knowing the assassin was sent by Poseidon, told Van Gogh that he too had killed for lies. But humans have a natural desire to uncover the truth, and those who kill for lies will eventually kill those who uncover it. This statement foretold the fate of the two assassins. No sooner had Paul finished speaking than Van Gogh shot him dead. A.W. arrived in the basement to find Teabag had escaped. Hearing the police sirens drawing closer, they quickly drove away. But Teabag hadn't fled. Instead, he hid in the car to track the assassins and uncover the truth. Teabag saw the assassins meet with a mysterious man, unfortunately obscured by a nearby tree. To get a clearer view, Teabag risked leaving the car, hid in a corner, and began frantically taking photos. To his shock, the man was Sarah's husband, Jacob. Meanwhile, Michael and his companions, who had just escaped, were on their way to an auto repair shop, making sure Abu had the vehicles ready as arranged. Just then, they realized Ja had disappeared. Michael hurriedly went looking for him, only to find Ja stealing fruit from a fruit stand. Michael, furious, scolded Ja as a liability. He then pushed Ja away and told Abu to have his men kill the junkie, saying they had given up on him. After they left, Ja pulled out a piece of map Michael had slipped into his hand, which read, Our escape plan is hidden under the workbench with the specific location on the other side. It turned out they were just putting on an act for Abu. Cha hurried to the location Michael had specified, while Michael led the others on a detour to the address given to Ja. Meanwhile, Lincoln was still searching for Michael and the others. When Ja arrived at the garage and successfully found the hidden handgun under the table, Abu's men suddenly arrived. Michael and his companions quickly arrived at the entrance of the auto repair shop, only to be surrounded by terrorists who had been lying in wait. Abu had already seen through Michael's plan, so he had arranged his men to ambush them there. Abu took out a knife, forcing Michael and his companions to kneel, and had his men record a video, wanting the world to see the consequences of opposing him. Just as Abu was about to slit Michael's throat, Lincoln appeared in time, controlling a heavy machine gun, forcing the terrorists to drop their weapons. Abu, holding Michael hostage, forced Lincoln to get out of the car. As the standoff continued, Whip couldn't stand by any longer, he slowly approached Michael, saying he once killed a thug who insulted his girlfriend, which landed him in prison. Abu didn't believe him and ordered his men to pick up their guns in preparation to fight back. Whip advanced again, verbally attacking. Abu instinctively pulled out his knife, trying to stop Whip, but Whip swiftly stabbed Abu with the knife. Lincoln then shot down Abu's men who were nearby, hearing the gunfire. Surrounding terrorists quickly approached, forcing Michael and his companions to continue evading pursuit. They reached an abandoned restaurant where Whip asked who this man was. Michael, with tears in his eyes, said, He's my brother. The two embraced each other emotionally. I can't believe it. Back at the prison. Why? No. I can't no, get out. No. Michael, concerned, asked how Sarah and his son were. Lincoln assured him they were fine and not to worry. Just then, they saw on TV that Abu had been killed. The terrorists had taken over the local TV station and broadcasted that Michael and his companions had killed their leader. Now, the entire terrorist army declared war on Michael and his companions. Could they still escape the country? This absolutely takes the cake for the most melodramatic plot twist in Prison Break. And it's also the one that got roasted by the netizens the most. From the sparks of love struck between Michael and Sarah in Season 1, to Michael being thrown into Sona Prison in Season 2 to save Sarah, followed by Michael successfully breaking out of prison in Season 3 and embarking on a lone quest for revenge for his girlfriend Sarah. And finally, in Season 4, the two of them walking on the beach, finally relieved of their burdens. The last page of the prison break epilogue showing Michael and Sarah officially entering the Hall of Marriage brought immense happiness to countless fans. Yet, to save his pregnant wife, Michael once again plunges into the abyss, just when everyone thought Michael was dead. Prison Break Season 5 makes a comeback after 8 years. However, 
Sarah suddenly remarries with Michael's child Mike in tow, leaving many fans disappointed in her while also feeling sorry for Michael, who was presumed dead. What Sarah never expected was that the man she had shared a bed with for seven years was the mastermind behind Michael's fake death. Seeing the photo of the assassin taken by Teabag, Sarah is utterly dumbfounded and can hardly believe her eyes. At that moment, she suddenly remembers Mike is still at home and frantically runs towards her house. Luckily finding Mike safe, an anxious Sarah makes up an excuse to take Mike away. And just then, her husband Jacob arrives. Sarah lets Mike hide in the car and then gets straight to the point by showing him the photo. Jacob, adept at game theory, hurriedly explains that he found the phone, which was hacked at the phone store, to keep Sarah and the child from danger. He had a friend in the computer science department trace the killer's phone back. And then he contacted the killer, hoping to resolve the issue with money. But Sarah, unable to listen, steps on the gas and decisively leaves. Sarah takes Mike to her friend Heather's house and confides everything to her. But Heather suggests she might be overthinking due to recent events. First, she was attacked by a home invading killer. And then she saw evidence that Michael was alive. All of which could lead to a mistaken judgment. Heather mentions Jacob seems like a good man who gave her a new life. Heather asks for the name of the person who helped recover Jacob's phone data, mentioning she knows a professor at that school. Thus, through Heather's connections, Sarah meets Jacob's friend Andrew. Sarah politely inquires if he helped recover the phone data for Jacob, and Andrew confidently confirms he did, which matches Jacob's explanation. Just then, Sarah receives a call from Jacob, who anxiously asks her to come to the police station, and Sarah agrees to meet him. The police chief says they've caught a few suspects and asks victim Sarah to identify the assailants. Sarah decisively points out numbers 3, A.W., and 4, Van Gogh. Jacob then reiterates to Sarah that he's just a husband worried about his wife, not the Poseidon she mentioned. Jacob also presents the $100,000 he prepared to bribe the assassin, saying he had installed a tracker without the assassin's knowledge. Thanks to his calling the police in advance, they were able to easily arrest them. Hearing Jacob's flawless explanation, the naive Sarah chooses to believe him and once again embraces him. However, as soon as Sarah and Jacob leave, the prison guard releases A.W. Poseidon got you out first. I thought I was his favorite. The two assassins have already received news of Udi's escaping from prison and have killed a terrorist leader who escaped with them. Abu. Van Gogh. Confused. Asks why there was infighting. But A.W. says in their line of work, you just follow orders and don't ask questions you shouldn't. Clearly, they are unaware of the truth behind their actions. They are merely Poseidon's tools for murder. At this point, They've already received Poseidon's order to kill the terrorist Udis, who has just escaped from prison, also known as Michael, now on the run in Yemen. Just now, they successfully escaped Ojijia prison in Yemen, and with the cooperation of their companions, they also killed Abu, the leader of terrorists in the Middle East. In a bid for revenge for Abu, the terrorists put up an $80,000 bounty for capturing Michael and his crew, driven by faith and money. They crazily started to hunt down Michael and his companions. Michael led them to a hidden basement to replan their escape route. He was planning to head north by train as previously planned, but Lincoln knew that area was already occupied by terrorists. Lincoln suggested that Michael follow him to the airport to meet with Benjamin. However, Michael believed the airport, being the quickest way out of the country, would surely be controlled by the terrorists first. So, he stuck to his own opinion and did not agree with Lincoln's suggestion. At this moment, Lincoln suddenly exploded in anger. For the first time, he lashed out at Michael and demanded, Why are you still alive? What exactly happened? Today, if you don't clarify everything, we're not going anywhere. Michael had no choice but to reveal the truth. It turns out, just weeks before his wedding to Sarah, he received a call from the mysterious agent Poseidon. He said Paul had no judicial authority to pardon their crimes. Using this as leverage over Michael in a legal sense, Poseidon threatened that unless Michael worked for him, he could legally send Michael and his companions back to prison, this time for life without parole. Michael explained that Poseidon was a disgruntled policy expert at the CIA. This psychopath, to maximize his ideas, secretly created an organization within the CIA called 21 Void for his own use. He exploited Michael's talent for breaking out of prisons to free terrorists around the world to achieve his own ends. Initially, Michael did not agree to Poseidon's demands, 
resulting in Sarah being locked up in a women's prison and brutally beaten by the guards. Seeing his pregnant wife beaten like that, Michael had no choice but to compromise with the sinister Poseidon, sacrificing himself for his family's freedom. At this moment, the terrorist's gunfire sounded outside, and the group stealthily made their way to the train station. The place was swarming with terrorists. Lincoln again urged Michael to head to the airport, but Michael argued that the most dangerous place could be the safest. Seeing the porters moving things to the train station, he decided to disguise himself as a porter to blend in. Unfortunately, halfway there, terrorists stopped Lincoln to question him. Since Lincoln didn't speak their language, any attempt to communicate would blow his cover, leaving him no choice but to strike first. Then, they frantically ran for their lives. Using the train as cover, seeing a train approaching, Michael urged them to run to the other side of the train, narrowly escaping. However, what they did not expect was that Cyclops had already set his sights on them. Just now, Cyclops had approached his leader, claiming he had seen the man and could help track down the assassin, but the leader mocked him for being one-eyed and did not take his words seriously. Feeling slighted, Cyclops found the auto repair shop where Michael had studied the prison break plan. From the map, he deduced they were likely at the train station, which led him to track them down. He sent the photo he took to his leader, saying, Bring your weapons. I call the shots now. Meanwhile, Benjamin, along with Sheba and her family, arrived at the airport, which was in complete chaos, with flights unable to take off normally. Worse still, terrorists suddenly stormed the airport, sending everyone into a panic. At that moment, Benjamin saw a pilot stripping off his uniform, seemingly planning to escape alone in a plane. Thus, Benjamin, along with Sheba and others, followed him, but the pilot was quickly spotted by terrorists. Benjamin hiding behind the car was also discovered. Just as the terrorists were about to shoot, Sheba rushed in, claiming she had seen the killer of Abu. Taking advantage of the terrorists' diverted attention, Benjamin suddenly fought back, quickly taking down several of them, thereby saving the pilot. As a token of gratitude, the pilot agreed to help them escape the country. Meanwhile, the lucky-to-be-alive Michael planned to take them to another train station. Lincoln again tried to persuade Michael to go to the airport since it was only an 8-kilometer journey from there, whereas escaping north to the border was hundreds of kilometers away. But the stubborn Michael still trusted his intuition because he believed it was his intuition that had kept him alive until now. After saying this, Michael quickly got into the car, ready to head north. Although some teammates thought Lincoln made sense, Michael's position in their hearts was hard to shake. So they all followed Michael North. Reluctantly, Lincoln, unable to persuade his brother, also got in the car, but they hadn't gone far when they were suddenly stopped by a car crash, caused by Cyclops who had been tracking them. They hurriedly escaped into a hospital and then split up to look for a way out. Just reaching the basement, Michael suddenly saw a ventilation shaft next to him, but despite using all his strength, the cover wouldn't budge. At that moment, Cyclops had already barged in with terrorists, and Michael realized his decision was a mistake. He tearfully confessed to his brother Lincoln, he had intended to bear all the consequences alone, but instead, he made things worse for those around him. He once, like a ghost, secretly watched his wife and Mike in the park, too afraid to show himself. At that moment, Michael, in tears, regretted not discussing strategies with his brother from the beginning. Lincoln, of course, forgave Michael, then pulled him up and handed him a wrench. Whip had sharpened a knife, ready to fight at any moment, but only Ja remained calm and collected, holding a can of oxygen and a bucket of alcohol, singing while sprinkling the alcohol on the floor. Lincoln and Michael were eager to try. Just then, the terrorists, attracted by the singing, hurriedly changed direction. They came to the source of the singing and shot at the silhouette, which turned out to be a dummy made of human bones, hiding an oxygen tank inside that exploded upon being shot, giving the terrorists a free spark show. After experiencing the life and death situation, Michael decided to adopt Lincoln's plan and head to the airport. So, he called Benjamin to clarify the exact location, asking them to wait a bit longer. However, the situation at the airport was already dire, as terrorists had taken over, just as Michael and his group were about to leave. A sudden burst of gunfire hit Sid, critically wounding him. It turns out that Cyclops has caught up with them and he has heard the news that they are going to the airport. So Cyclops calls his associates at the airport. At that moment, the injured Sid, enduring the pain, knocked down Cyclops, interrupting their communication, only to be stabbed by Cyclops. Bearing the severe pain, Sid handcuffed himself to Cyclops. Michael and the others hurried over to help. But by then, Sid had already passed away. 
Seeing Cyclops grinning, Michael angrily punched him in the head. But to catch the plane as soon as possible, they had to leave Sid behind and continue on their way. Meanwhile, terrorists at the airport were gathering trucks to block the runway, leaving no chance for takeoff. Benjamin pleaded with the pilot to wait another five minutes, but seeing more and more trucks, the pilot decisively started the plane. Leaving my friend, shut it down, shut it down! You stop me, no one gets out. Your friends can still make it to safety. We will not. At that moment, Benjamin's phone rang, seeing the terrorists chasing the plane relentlessly. Lincoln told them to escape quickly while he thought of another plan. They watched the plane fly over their heads. A tribute to the ending of the first season, Sheba answers the phone and tells Lincoln to find Omar, but he can't hear him clearly because of the noise. Seeing the terrorists' vehicles closing in, they quickly turned and continued to run for their lives. They dodged the terrorists' pursuit all the way and finally arrived at an abandoned warehouse. If they couldn't come up with an escape plan, their deaths would be even more gruesome than those of the people outside. At that moment, Lincoln suddenly remembered Sheba's friend Omar, who wasn't the most reliable but was now their only hope for a way out. They quickly found Omar packing his bags and explained their reason for coming. Omar said he would take them along for Sheba's sake, but with only one car and not enough space for everyone, he told them to drive his other vehicle, a land cruiser. Michael kept Whip to watch over Omar and went with Lincoln and Ja to get the car. After they left, Omar took the opportunity to knock Whip out when he wasn't looking, just as Michael and the others found the car. Terrorists caught up with them. Lincoln, with his superb driving skills, quickly lost the terrorists. By then, Whip had been tied up, revealing that Omar had no intention of taking them along. Seeing Lincoln arriving in the Land Cruiser, Omar hurriedly tried to drive away, but was quickly pulled out of the car by the agile Lincoln. Whip was ready to teach Omar a lesson, but Ja intervened just in time, reminding them they still needed Omar to escape Yemen. Omar mentioned he was planning to go to Fakes, over 400 kilometers away, where the people were simple and there was no war. The journey required crossing a vast desert, and without a map, only he knew the route. They immediately set off on their escape. Meanwhile, the two assassins who had received orders to kill Michael were heading to the NSA to use their satellite surveillance to locate Michael and his team. Since AW had once worked at the NSA, she got her former colleague Gloria to help. But Gloria could only allow them limited access as observers. Just then, Lincoln received a call from Sheba. It turned out that several people under the leadership of Benjamin has arrived safely in Jordan tomorrow ready to fly to the United States. She thanked Lincoln and said that when we meet, we will buy Lincoln a drink. But this call allowed the NSA to track their location. Soon, a drone followed them. Though Michael and his team were completely unaware, they stopped at a roadside gas station to fill up the tank due to the long journey ahead. While filling up Michael goes to an internet cafe inside the petrol station where he connects with a man called Blue Hawaii, who can free him from the seven years of Poseidon's control. Van Gogh called the terrorists and gave them Michael and his team's precise location. Meanwhile, Michael and his team were basking in the joy of almost escaping Yemen. Suddenly, they saw two vehicles full of armed terrorists approaching. Lincoln dropped the fuel pump and urgently called for Michael, but Michael was still busy inside. He hurriedly asked Blue Hawaii to take a screenshot of the tattoo on his hand. Whip found Omar's gun, but Omar said it only had one bullet, intended for his suicide if captured by terrorists. At that moment, Omar suddenly fell, shot. The others used the car for cover, just when they thought they were doomed. The quick-thinking Whip spotted a fuel tanker near the terrorists and decisively fired the only bullet. The exploding tanker instantly blew the terrorists away, as they were just catching their breath. A red SUV approached from a distance, with no choice. They continued their escape by car. However, they hadn't gone far when Michael stopped the car. As their guide, Omar, was dead. They gave him a simple burial, just as they were planning their next move. A burst of gunfire came their way again, forcing them back into the car to flee. This scene was also captured by the drone. AW demanded to continue the tracking but was stopped by Gloria, who realized that this was not surveillance but murder. They were quickly thrown out by the NSA after their plot was exposed. Michael stopped the car again after driving some distance because the sun was directly overhead, making it impossible to discern directions. Shaw's phone had also lost signal, and when they got out, they realized their tires had betrayed their location. Michael took out a telescope and saw that it was Cyclops, the killer of Sid. At that time, Cyclops stopped to refuel his car, knowing his fuel would outlast Michael's, ensuring he could follow them until their fuel ran out. Michael took out a hose, planning to siphon fuel from the white Land Cruiser into the black SUV. 
Allowing the SUV to reach the destination, they decided to leave a small amount of gasoline in the white Land Cruiser, which would be driven by one person to lure the enemy away. For fairness, Michael brought four stones, three red and one white. Whoever drew the white stone would be responsible for luring the enemy. Coincidentally, the others all drew red stones, leaving the white one in Michael's hand. Lincoln was unwilling to let Michael take the risk and wanted to swap, but Michael convinced him otherwise, saying he still had the crucial task of finding their destination. Michael asked them to leave marks to help him find them later, and then they set off. Cyclops relentlessly pursued from behind. At that moment, Michael suddenly crossed in front of Cyclops, who naturally followed. Michael then took out a red stone he had in his hand, revealing there was never a white stone. He had devised the plan to protect those around him from threat. As the fuel in the car was nearly exhausted, Michael found cover behind an obstacle. Cyclops quickly lost sight of his target. Holding his AK-47, he meticulously searched but found the target vehicle slowly moving away. So he hurriedly drove after it. Soon, Michael's car came to a stop. Cyclops, with a smirk on his face, slowly approached with his gun drawn, only to find the car empty except for a stone pressed on the accelerator pedal. By then, Michael had already sneaked into Cyclops' car. Hearing the engine roar, Cyclops turned and sprayed bullets wildly with his machine gun. Michael took the opportunity to grab a screwdriver from the car door and quickly hit at the back of the car, attacking Cyclops from the roof when he was unguarded. The two engaged in a life-or-death duel, evenly matched until both collapsed. Michael then used the screwdriver to pierce Cyclops' remaining eye. However, as Michael stood up, Cyclops stabbed him in the abdomen with a dagger coated in antifreeze. Ignoring the pain, Michael rushed to find Lincoln but soon had to abandon the broken-down car and proceed on foot. Meanwhile, Lincoln and the others found the place Omar had spoken of, a peaceful haven compared to war-torn Yemen, but they couldn't be happy because Michael had not yet returned. As night fell, Michael struggled through the desert, his infected wound causing him to collapse several times, until he finally fell unconscious. Images from his past flashed before Michael's eyes, wondering if these were the signs of death approaching. Just as he closed his eyes, the sound of fireworks nearby reignited hope in his heart. Signals set off by Lincoln for his brother. Lincoln climbed to the roof of the car shouting Michael's name. Michael! Michael! <sighs> but did not get the slightest response. Just as Lincoln was about to give up hope, someone saw Michael staggering back, barely alive. Michael collapsed on the ground, and Lincoln along with the others hurriedly rushed to his side. Michael told Lincoln that he had been poisoned and needed to be taken to a hospital as soon as possible, but there was no doctor in their small tribe. The only doctor is in the city they just escaped from, but it's impossible for them to go back now. Without a new plan for treatment, Michael would soon die from the poisoning. The escaping prisoner was on the verge of death, but under the attentive care of his good brother, Michael could barely hold on for a few more hours. Cha found a cargo ship heading to Greece, claiming fishermen could help Michael find the best doctor there. But Lincoln worried about Michael still being an internationally wanted terrorist. Once Michael showed his face, he would be arrested. Whip is very anxious and says to Lincoln, Are you just going to let Michael die? What kind of a brother are you? Clearly, Whip misunderstood Lincoln's intention, almost earning himself a beating from Lincoln, who actually intended to seek Sarah's help. At that moment, Sarah was having a cheerful conversation with her current husband, Jacob, when suddenly she received a call that her husband, presumed dead for seven years, was still alive, leaving her almost speechless with excitement. Lincoln informed Sarah about Michael's poisoning, knowing that Sarah, being Michael's primary physician at Fox River State Penitentiary, was very familiar with his medical condition. Sarah told Lincoln that Michael urgently needed a blood transfusion, and it would be difficult to find Michael's blood type in their location, even if they found it. Michael might not survive that long. Suddenly remembering she has the universal O-negative blood type, Sarah decided to go to Michael herself to perform the transfusion, sharing this plan with her husband, Jacob. Jacob, upset by this, strongly discouraged Sarah from going to save Michael. And if I told you not to go? If it's a big word in that sentence, Jacob, are you telling me not to go? No, of course not. Seeing he couldn't dissuade Sarah, Jacob reluctantly let her go. Lincoln and Whip, along with Michael, went to the meeting place they had arranged with Sarah, while Ja, having grown fond of the place, decided to stay behind. After a brief farewell, Michael and his two companions boarded the cargo ship to Greece. After a long 12-hour journey, they finally arrived at Crete Island in Greece, 
where a kind fisherman helped them find a homestay. While Lincoln went out to find food, Whip took the opportunity to express his long-held feelings to Michael. I got a lot invested in you. A lot of things to tell me, you know? You can't die on me now, Michael, you know? Please. Turns out, Whip was the capable assistant Michael demanded from Poseidon, planning the prison break in Yemen for four years, developing a bond like that of real brothers. However, Lincoln's arrival made Whip feel replaced in Michael's heart, leaving him sullen during this time. He prayed earnestly for Michael to pull through. In his coma, Michael dreamed of his son Mike playing with an airplane, which suddenly accidentally fell into the bushes. As Mike went to retrieve it, he was suddenly carried away by a mysterious person, startling Michael awake from the dream. At that moment, Lincoln returned with Sarah. Sarah, who had accepted Michael's death, could hardly believe her eyes upon seeing him alive again. Seeing her once dearly loved husband, Sarah couldn't help but kiss Michael, swearing to cure him. Then, using the medical equipment she brought, Sarah began the blood transfusion for Michael. To not disturb Sarah during the treatment, Lincoln and Whip stepped aside. Whip apologized for his earlier misunderstanding towards Lincoln, who graciously accepted, saying they were now bonded by adversity. Just like real brothers, Michael also gradually showed signs of recovery, longing to see a photo of his son. But as he unintentionally flipped to the next photo, Michael sat up in bed in shock, seeing the man who had been harming him, Poseidon, married to his wife. Michael finally understood why Poseidon betrayed him four years ago. Poseidon wanted Michael gone, so he could fully possess Sarah. Four years ago, Poseidon represented Michael in a meeting with the CIA Deputy Director Harlan, who was investigating the event known as 21 Void to find the traitorous mastermind behind it. Only after serving Poseidon for three years did Michael realize that the tasks assigned to him were not approved by the CIA but were secretly orchestrated by Poseidon himself. To stop Harlan's investigation, Poseidon shot and killed Harlan, then ordered Michael to dispose of the body. At the same time, Poseidon framed Michael for Harlan's murder. Since then, Michael began planning to return to Sarah, but that led him to spend another four years in Ojigia prison, suddenly remembering that her son was still with the archvillain Poseidon. Sarah hurriedly prepared to go back and save her child. Meanwhile, Lincoln also thought of a way to return to the United States. Before coming to Yemen, Sucre had told him that he had found a job on a cargo ship, frequently traveling around the world. So, Lincoln made a call to Sucre. At that moment, Sucre had just unloaded cargo not far from Lincoln. However, he was just a worker, and if they wanted to take a ship back to the US, they would have to charter the entire vessel, which would cost $50,000. But Lincoln did not have that kind of money. Hearing this, Sarah quickly took off her family heirloom. Michael cautioned Sarah to temporarily conceal herself and not let Poseidon discover that Sarah knew their secret, as it would put both her son and herself at risk. Sarah needed to find an opportunity to take her son and hide. He promised to find a way to return quickly to find them. And if he hurts our son, I'll kill him. At this time, Poseidon had already discovered Sarah was heading back to the United States and speculated that Michael and his group would return in the next few days. Thus, he arranged for assassins to issue a warrant through sea, land, and air channels for the murderer of Harlan, ensuring that Michael would be immediately killed upon appearance. Never have I seen such a despicable man, not only framing Michael but also seizing Michael's beautiful wife. And he did all this just to prove he was smarter than Michael, having learned the truth. Sarah returned from Greece, planning to act as if she knew nothing and then seize an opportunity to rescue her son, Poseidon. Looking at the beautiful Sarah, greedily kissed her, he also cautiously asked about Michael's situation. Sarah, forcing herself to stay calm, said that Michael has changed and is no longer the person she once knew. Later, Sarah went upstairs to her son's room, only to find that her son was not there. Where's Mike? At a friend's house. Asleep. Alerted, Poseidon discovers that Sarah's heirloom ring is missing. Sarah had to find an excuse, but apparently Poseidon wasn't buying it. On the other side, Michael, having recovered from his illness, found Sucre working on the cargo ship. The two brothers, not having seen each other for seven years, embraced tightly. Whip looked a bit awkward, not expecting Michael to have so many close friends. Sucre took Michael to the captain, who asked for a fee of $50,000. However, Michael only presented Sarah's family heirloom ring. The greedy captain examined the ring closely, warning that if it turned out to be fake, they would all end up feeding the fish. 
Thus, Michael and his group successfully boarded the cargo ship heading to the United States. Michael was curious about why Sucre was working on a cargo ship. Sucre explained that it was to earn extra money to support his family. The job as a crew member not only offered a very substantial salary, but it also allowed him to engage in some side business. Unexpectedly, the honest and simple Sucre had started such a business. In the evening, while the captain was working, he suddenly received a fax displaying a wanted poster for Udi's. The scene shifted to Poseidon receiving a report from Van Gogh, stating that Udi's had been spotted on a cargo ship in the Mediterranean Sea. Alerted by the captain, the military sent a SEAL team to the freighter, and if they found Udi's, they shot him on sight, which is exactly what Poseidon wanted. Meanwhile, Michael and his companions were unaware of the looming danger, as they were leisurely playing cards, Michael suddenly heard the sound of the door being locked. He rushed to check and found the door indeed locked. The SEAL team had arrived at the cargo ship's location. Just when a few people don't know what to do Sucre comes up with an idea, but he's going to have to suffer for it. Based on the captain's report, they quickly made their way to the targeted room, only to find Sucre tied to a chair and beaten black and blue. Realizing the targets might have escaped through the window, they quickly turned to pursue. After releasing Sucre and confirming he was a victimized crew member, they took him away, and the assault team also vacated the room. Unbeknownst to them, Michael and his companions were hiding inside a closet. I haven't seen him in years. He calls me, says he needs a ride. I don't know any Canyon Outis. The guy's name is Schofield! At this moment, Michael and his companions, following Sucre's plan, were escaping when they were suddenly discovered by the searching SEAL team, frightening them into hiding. The commandos threw tear gas directly at them, ready to smoke them out. The captain, watching the surveillance, that is the ventilation is gonna ruin my cargo, was dumbfounded and took out his anger on Sucre. Sucre, not to be outdone, directly reported that the captain was smuggling weapons. Hearing this, the assault team immediately went to support. As the captain was checking the weapon storage through the surveillance, Sucre quietly freed himself from his restraints. Michael and his group successfully escaped to a safe area and then barricaded the door, taking advantage of the captain's fainting. Sucre changed the cargo ship's course and quickly regrouped with Michael and his companions. The assault team also discovered that the ship had deviated from its course and the navigation system had been sabotaged. Even if repaired, the ship would sail out of territorial waters, so they requested their superiors to terminate the operation. Meanwhile, Sarah secretly called Heather, asking her to pick up her son from a friend's house, promising to find a way to meet her. Then, Sarah sneaked into the hallway to find a gun for self-defense. At that moment, Poseidon appeared. He didn't directly expose Sarah's disguise but expressed his dissatisfaction before leaving. Heather called to say she had picked up Mike, and hearing her son's voice, Sarah finally felt relieved. Sarah then took out the gun she had hidden earlier, loaded it with bullets, ready to end the journey for the villain who framed her husband and seduced her. Poseidon also soon received the news that the SEAL team was withdrawing. It seemed he had underestimated Michael and his companions. He then resorted to his last trump card. The scene shifted as a missile rose from the nearby sea. Michael and his group realized something was wrong and quickly escaped on a lifeboat. A dazzling flash of light passed, and the entire cargo ship turned to ashes. Sarah, with a gun aimed at Poseidon, who had lived with her for seven years, found him not as simple as she had imagined. Just as Heather brought Mike home, Poseidon's arranged Van Gogh suddenly appeared. Knowing that Mike was still in danger, Sarah had no choice but to put down her gun. It seemed that the only one who could match wits with this arch-villain was the highly intelligent Michael. This is definitely one of the best episodes of Prison Break Season 5. And it's the beginning of a head-to-head -head game between the two main characters. Will the cunning and treacherous Poseidon triumph? Or will Michael, with his superior intellect, come out on top? Let's wait and see. In the previous episode, Poseidon, hell-bent on leading Michael to his doom, actually calls in a missile from a submarine to blow the entire cargo ship to smithereens. Luckily, Michael and his companions react in time to jump into the sea, narrowly escaping death. At dawn, drifting in the sea all night, they finally saw a nearby fishing boat, and the lucky few were saved. At this moment, Michael recalls a scene with Poseidon six years ago. Always vigilant, Poseidon observes every move Michael makes, even discovering the new tattoo on Michael's body. Poseidon knows this is part of Michael's new plan but chooses not to expose it. Confident in his own abilities, he takes Michael to his secret base, where the entrance is secured with a top-notch facial recognition system, making it accessible to no one but Poseidon. This is his secret space station 21. It's then that Michael requests a helper, Whip, someone he has been keeping an eye on for a long time. 
Considering Whip poses no real threat, Poseidon readily agrees. They are taken to Marseille, France. As soon as they land, Michael receives a message from Sarah. After a brief exchange, Michael senses something is off. Because the way the message refers to their son is not how he and Sarah usually do. Indeed, it's Poseidon posing as Sarah. While the real Sarah has been imprisoned, Michael doesn't confront the issue directly but decides to outmaneuver, planning a swift return to New York to rescue Sarah and their son. But, as he is currently known as the terrorist duties, returning through official channels is out of the question. Crossing the Atlantic by boat would take two weeks. Lincoln shares his own experiences over the past seven years. After breaking up with his girlfriend, Sophia, Lincoln's life has been down on its luck, leading him back to his old, quick money-making ways. His employer turns out to be Luca, the son of John from season one. But when Lincoln realizes the delivery contains materials for drug production, his conscience kicks in, and he dumps the $100,000 worth of goods into the sea, making an enemy of Luca. Perhaps Luca's private plane could get Michael and the others back to the States. Lincoln directly calls Luca, lying that he has gathered the $100,000, but he needs Luca to take him and another person back to the US. Meanwhile, Sucre and Whip are solving their basic needs when they suddenly see their wanted news on TV and rush to inform Michael. Just then, Luca calls Lincoln, telling them to get to Lyon Airport by midnight, fail to bring the money, and they'll pay with their lives. At the same time, Poseidon begins planning for Michael's return. Van Gogh is puzzled, unable to see why Udis would risk coming back and facing arrest. Poseidon shares the truth with them, omitting only that Harlan's death was his doing, blamed on Michael. He also brings in Andrew, an IT genius, to decode the meaning behind Michael's tattoos. Due to the encrypted Arabic containing too much information, breaking down its deeper meaning requires significant AI-driven data computation. Andrew asks for more time, but Poseidon reveals he already knows Michael's whereabouts. Meanwhile, Michael, looking at the tattoo on his arm, writes a mysterious letter, addressed to Teabag, the man who donated a prosthetic arm. Teabag then learns that the mysterious person is Michael, and Michael also writes a letter to get in touch with Benjamin. Soon, they arrive at Lyon Airport, where Whip notices their destination is Chicago. Not New York as Michael intended, Michael hands Whip a letter he had prepared earlier, instructing him to follow the directions inside. Then, Michael turns off his phone, ready to board the plane back home. All this is monitored by Poseidon from afar in New York. He deduces Michael is about to arrive at the airport and sends A.W. and Van Gogh to lie in wait. Quickly, A.W. and Van Gogh notice Michael's phone has been turned on, signaling his plane has landed, following the location of the mobile phone. A.W. and Van Gogh immediately rushed up, and all that was waiting for them was a mobile phone. Sucre, hiding in the shadows, smiles knowingly before leaving. Meanwhile, Michael is still on Luca's private plane. Upon arriving at the agreed warehouse, Lincoln bluntly states they don't have the money. Luca orders his men to take them out and execute them. Michael points to a man outside with black sunglasses, claiming he's a drug enforcement officer he brought along. With a wave of his hand, his team would storm in, catching them red-handed, just like Luca's father ended up in jail. Luca, disbelieving, points his gun at Lincoln and Michael. Michael waved his hand and the man outside made a phone call. Then three black SUVs came rushing in. Seeing this, Luca panics and hastily retreats with his men. The newcomers are Benjamin and Sheba. Among others, they arrived at a safe place. Their next step is figuring out how to rescue Sarah and Mike and take down Poseidon. Considering Benjamin's face is known to Poseidon, involving him might endanger his family. So, Michael decisively asks Benjamin to step back for now. Since Sheba is an unfamiliar face to Poseidon, she volunteers to join Michael's team with enthusiasm. Luca, fooled, returns to the warehouse only to find his goods untouched. Checking the surveillance, he realizes he's been trapped. Noticing an ETC device in the car, Luca plans to ask a friend at the transport bureau to track the vehicles, vowing to kill Lincoln once found. Meanwhile, Poseidon arranges for A.W. and Van Gogh to move Sarah, who's been captured, to a lakeside villa at 4 in the afternoon. Seeing these suspicious actions, Van Gogh begins to doubt Poseidon. He had joined the 21 space organization to find Harlan's killer, Booties. But now, it seems to be a personal vendetta between Poseidon and Michael. Van Gogh suggests to his partner, A.W., that they quit, but A.W., fully under Poseidon's influence, disagrees. Poseidon watches all this unfold. As evening arrives, 
Michael and two others drive to Sarah's house. Finding it dark and seemingly empty, Michael checks the mailbox at the entrance and the nearby sewer. Understanding why Sarah has not been replying to his letters for years, Poseidon had been throwing the origami cranes he sent into the sewer. They quietly search the house for Sarah. Seeing photos of Poseidon with his wife and son, Michael feels a mix of emotions. Finding no one after a thorough search, they decide to contact Poseidon directly via phone. Through their conversation, Michael confirms Sarah is alive and with him. They agree to meet at a steakhouse the next noon, setting the stage for a showdown between masters. By noon the next day, Poseidon had arranged for Van Gogh, who had been waiting for a long time. But Michael's whereabouts were still undetected. Poseidon guessed that Michael was trying to make him expose himself first. So he instructed Van Gogh to speak loudly on purpose to attract the hidden Lincoln's attention. Lincoln then stood up and followed. Noticing Lincoln, Poseidon immediately informed A.W. to follow from behind. Just then, a bus passed by Lincoln. And after that, Lincoln disappeared. A.W. Noticing a garage nearby, immediately drew her gun and chased after, but upon reaching the garage, she found no one. A.W. hurriedly reported back to Poseidon, but the underground garage had no signal, forcing her to return to find Poseidon. Poseidon, realizing he had been tricked, quickly drove away, and all this was closely observed by Michael from a rooftop. Sheba, who had stopped at the side of the road after hearing Michael's information about the car, followed him. Poseidon, quickly sensing he was being followed, prepared to shoot to kill during a red light stop. However, seeing a new face, he thought it was a coincidence and hurriedly drove off. Lincoln and Sheba track Poseidon to where he has parked his car, and then Lincoln quickly notifies Michael to come over. Finding a pool of blood in the trunk, Michael immediately sensed danger for Sarah, and then he found a child's drawing in the car, deducing it was a hint from his son. Michael compared the map in the car with his son's drawing. Noticing the outline of the hydra on the drawing closely resembled a lake on the map. The marked cross on the map must be the location hinted at by his son. So Michael decided to investigate. Sheba was about to drive, but Lincoln held her back, unwilling to put her in further danger, and asked her to go back to her family. With that, Sheba watched as the two men left. On the other side, Whip, following Michael's instructions, arrived in Chicago and gave the coordinates to a taxi driver. After checking, the driver said it was impossible to reach as the destination was in the middle of a lake. The next day, Whip went to the lake to rent a boat to the center, and at that moment, T-Bag, following Michael's clue, also arrived. After unbuckling his seatbelt, T-Bag lets out a long sigh, takes another look at the letter Michael gave him, and then takes out his phone to turn on the recording function, checking no one was around. T-Bag started to pray to God, hoping to meet the most important person in his life. At the lake's center, Whip, following the GPS, found it was a buoy's location, T-Bag searched around and eventually found a black bag underwater, opening it to discover a bottle of plasma. Unaware of Michael's intentions, Whip takes the item and leaves. As soon as he reaches the shore, he encounters T-Bag. What kind of honorific is Whip? Only one person calls me Whip. You ain't him. Can you out it? Who are you? You're Dave Martin, aren't you? How'd you know that? Huh? All your answers are right in here. What? Schofield was looking for a partner at Coleman Prisons. What you trying to tell me? Looking for someone who could handle himself. You reminded him of a certain someone. And with your innate ability to thrive, rising to the top in even the worst of cages, did you learn it? Or was it ingrained in you? And so he did a little research. It was ingrained in you, son. You got it from me. Who has been waiting for a long time. Whip never imagined the disheveled man before him was his biological father. At the same time, Michael followed his son's map to the lake house, hiding in the shadows. He saw Poseidon driving away. Michael rushed to check, and through a window, he indeed found Mike inside, prompting Michael to call Lincoln immediately. However, just as Lincoln was about to go, he saw a car approaching from afar, thinking Poseidon had returned, so he quickly hid in the car. Luckily, the car was just passing by, so Lincoln told Michael he was safe. However, right after Lincoln hung up, the car came back, revealing it was Luca, who had been seeking revenge on Lincoln, confirming it was Lincoln. Luca fired several shots, and Lincoln fell into a pool of blood. At this moment, Michael saw his son go to the next room to find his mom. When Mike reached his mom, he startled and then fearfully returned to the living room. Michael, sensing something was wrong, 
decisively entered the house. Michael is thrilled to see his son has grown so big and misses him so much. Then Michael tells Mike that he has received his map and promises to get him and his mom out. But Mike said he hadn't drawn any map. Just a few days ago, Poseidon was inspired by Mike's talent for drawing and intentionally created a ciphered drawing that Michael could understand, imitating Mike's style. Then, Poseidon lured Michael to the lakeside villa, leaving Mike in the living room as bait while pretending to leave, purposely allowing Michael to take the chance to come in. Unexpectedly, the always meticulous Michael fell into the trap set by his enemy, Poseidon. Could Michael have just died like this? Time rewinds to six minutes earlier, A.W disguised as Sarah, is waiting for Michael to take the bait, with the real Sarah tied up directly below her. Sarah curses Poseidon as a radical maniac, but he remains unaffected. Poseidon claims he is merely advancing the country's grand ambitions, needing only to recruit a few elite individuals for the task. This is why Michael was chosen. However, Poseidon notices Michael's unwavering focus on Sarah and conceives the idea to eliminate him, intending to take Sarah for himself. Thus, he nominally sends Michael to Ojijia prison to rescue the terrorist Abu, effectively sending him to his death. At that moment, Van Gogh enters to report on his duties. Sarah believes the clever Michael will defeat this madman, but she can't just sit and wait. Holding on to hope, Sarah reveals everything she learned from Michael, including that Poseidon killed Harlan and framed Michael. Enraged by her words, Poseidon loses control and punches Sarah. Van Gogh, shocked by this, realizes the murderer he's been seeking is the very person commanding him. At that moment, the surveillance feed shows Michael and Lincoln have arrived. Poseidon has already arranged for Van Gogh to kill them all, then pretends to leave the house to give Michael a chance to sneak in. A.W., disguised as Sarah, sees Michael falling for the trap and suddenly stands up, aiming her gun at Michael. Then, Van Gogh comes up from the basement, urging A.W. to hold her fire, insisting they need clarity on Harlan's death. They plan to hand Michael over to the CIA and then disappear with A.W., but A.W., refusing to see reason, shoots and kills Van Gogh, who was in her way. Michael takes the opportunity to grab his son and flee to the garage, telling his son to go find Uncle Lincoln outside while he blocks the door to buy time for his son. Under heavy gunfire, Michael can no longer hold out. Just as A.W. is about to open the door and kill Michael, Sarah, who has broken free, Knocks A.W. unconscious from behind. Mike runs outside only to be deceived and taken away by Poseidon, who has just arrived. By the time Michael and Sarah emerge, it's already too late. Michael urgently pulls Sarah to find his brother Lincoln, only to discover Lincoln has been shot and is lying inside the car. Fortunately, the bullet did not hit any vital parts. They rush Lincoln to the hospital before the police arrive for investigation and hastily leave. Poseidon takes Mike to his office at the university. Andrew was diligently cracking the secret behind Michael's tattoos. In order to stabilize Mike, the ruthless Poseidon falsely claims that Sarah is dead, and that Sarah's killer is the wanted terrorist duties. Seeing the warrant on the computer screen, the innocent Mike quickly believes these lies. Meanwhile, Michael and Sarah arrive at a lakeside. Although his son is in Poseidon's hands, Michael is not panicked because he already has a plan to take down Poseidon. At that moment, Teabag and Whip arrive by car. Michael also explains why he chose Teabag as a helper. Because Poseidon was monitoring all of Michael's potential resources and allies. Except for those he had looked down upon. Michael believes that if given a life he has never experienced before, Teabag would serve him out of gratitude. Then, Michael calls Poseidon to express his determination to take back Mike. But Michael is rebuked by Mike, who tells him to stay away from his dad. Michael hadn't expected Poseidon to brainwash his son. He decides to strike back. Michael arranges for Sarah to go to the hospital to ensure Lincoln is safe. While Teabag and Whip go in search of another trump card that Poseidon doesn't know about, Michael himself heads to Poseidon's stronghold. While Michael is organizing his actions, Poseidon is also tracking Michael's phone. Andrew discovers Michael's phone moving north and then turning off midway. Not far from there is the North New York State Zoo, Sarah's favorite place to take Mike, Poseidon. Having often seen Michael watching Sarah and Mike from hiding, concludes that Michael will definitely be there. Then, Poseidon and A.W. rush to the zoo to look for Michael. At this moment, Andrew calls to say he has cracked the tattoo on Michael's palm, which is a quote from Napoleon, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Poseidon realizes he has been played. Meanwhile, Michael had already arrived at Poseidon's office door, and with his hands clasped together, 
The tattoo of Poseidon's face on the back of his hands successfully fooled the facial recognition system, Michael manages to take the hard drive from the server, gaining control of all the secrets of the 21 space organization, but with Mike as his leverage, Poseidon seems to have a stalemate with Michael, so they agree to meet at the old dockyard at 5 o'clock the next afternoon. On the other side, Sarah, arriving at the hospital, finds Lincoln is no longer there, the nurse says they had to let him go because he insisted on leaving, just as Sarah is about to leave. She hears a doctor mention another gunshot victim in critical condition, Sarah knows this person is the assassin Van Gogh, so she decides to ask him about her son's whereabouts. At this moment, Van Gogh is barely hanging on to life, realizing his conscience, he decisively writes down Mike's location. Meanwhile, Lincoln, enduring his pain, leaves the hospital to settle his personal vendetta with Luca. Even with his injuries, Lincoln easily takes down Luca, because Lincoln had called the police in advance. They quickly surround the area, and Luca is arrested and jailed. On the other side, Teabag and his son follow Michael's instructions and find the mysterious man, Blue Hawaii whom Michael had previously contacted at a gas station in Yemen, Blue Hawaii's specialty is reconstructing scenes. Years ago, during a mission, Michael met him in prison and, out of compassion, rescued him. Now, it's time for Blue Hawaii to showcase his skills. With all the preparations complete, Michael arrives at the old dockyard to meet with Poseidon. Poseidon, confident, still refuses to hand over Mike. When Michael draws his gun, A.W. appears, forcing Michael to hand over the gun to Poseidon. What Michael doesn't expect is that Whip arrives to help him, but in the next second Whip is shot by A.W. and takes his gun. Teabag, hiding in the shadows, sees his son wounded and rushes out in a panic. At that moment, police sirens are heard in the distance. It turns out Poseidon had called the police in advance to arrest the terrorist duties. Hearing this, Whip, emotionally charged, lunges forward to snatch the gun from A.W., forgetting A.W. had just seized another handgun. A gunshot rings out, and Whip falls to the ground in pain. To prevent further harm to others, Michael has no choice but to compromise with Poseidon. Then, Poseidon takes Michael to retrieve the hard drive. By now, the assault team had already entered the boathouse, while A.W. was distracted. Teabag recklessly rushed up and broke A.W.'s neck with his robotic hand, avenging the son he had just met and Teabag was arrested and sent to prison for this. Perhaps prison is Teabag's destiny. Meanwhile, Poseidon is leading Michael deeper into the dockyard when Michael's phone suddenly rings. It turns out Sarah and Lincoln have rescued their son from another location in the college, based on the information provided by Van Gogh, and have also captured Poseidon's associate, Andrew. Realizing he's in a dire situation, Poseidon prepares to kill Michael, thinking that with Michael dead, there would be no evidence of the hard drive's whereabouts. Suddenly, the sound of the SWAT team distracts Poseidon, allowing Michael to make his escape. Michael discards his jacket and then puts on another one he had prepared in advance. Before running into a small hut, Poseidon follows, shooting at Michael, only to realize after firing that the scene behind the small door was a recreation of the moment he killed Harlan. Realizing too late he has been tricked, Michael wasn't shot because Poseidon was using the gun that had just been confiscated from him, and the scene was meticulously crafted by Blue Hawaii. Admiring Michael's ingenuity, Poseidon isn't afraid, thinking the police will soon arrive and reveal the fabrication. However, Michael mentioned that both the interior scene and he would disappear. It turns out that the scene was set up inside a truck container, and Blue Hawaii was about to drive them away in the truck. At a critical moment, Poseidon pushes Michael out of the truck and jumps out, leading to a fierce struggle between them. Poseidon was soon knocked to the ground by a vengeful Michael. Michael is taken back for investigation. The cunning Poseidon started acting again, just as he was preparing to leave. Another wave of police arrived in time, accusing Poseidon of being suspected of murdering Harlan. Poseidon thought the evidence was from the recently fabricated scene. What he hadn't expected was that Michael, upon re-entering his base, had left the long-sealed bloodstains of Harlan at the scene. With a bewildered face, Poseidon looked at Michael and realized he had been utterly defeated. The scene then shifts to Michael arriving at the office of CIA Director Roberts, Poseidon's associate. Andrew is arrested and reveals all of Poseidon's crimes. With overwhelming evidence, Roberts officially exonerates Michael and offers him a position, which Michael politely declines, wishing only to be with his family. Thus ends the long chase of prison break. With Michael alive and with his family, perhaps the most fulfilling conclusion, the scene returns to Fox River State Penitentiary from Season 1. Poseidon, smiling, enters his cell, 
confident he won't be there long because of his skills. At that moment, Teabag jumps down from the upper bunk, and Poseidon's smile freezes.